So to get us all started, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Paul Swinney, the Centre's Director of Policy and Research, that's going to give us an overview uh, of our analysis of COVID and levelling up. So, Paul, over to you. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Andrew. And good afternoon, everybody. And it's great to have so many people on the call. So as Andrew said, the main focus of Outlook this year is to look at how COVID and, and levelling up agenda interact with one another. And that's what I'm going to run through now in, uh, in very short order. And there's lots more detail in the report, both in terms of this topic in particular and other things too that we look at as well. So please do go and take a look. Now, government was elected in on uh, the premise of levelling up and COVID has clearly got in the way. Now, one of the big challenges I think around levelling up is there isn't still any particular definition about what we mean by levelling up. There's a general acceptance that's about trying to improve the performance of the North and England of North and Midlands, sorry, of England in particular, but no actual measure of that. In order to put some metrics around this in, in this report, what we've done is we've used the claim and count measure, which is a measure of unemployment related benefit claimants, to understand both what is the levelling up challenge, but as you will see in terms of the next couple of slides, about how COVID has had an impact on that as well. Now, it's certainly not the, the measure or only measure of levelling up, but it's certainly the most timely measure, which is particularly important when we're thinking about levelling up, um, especially in, as this analysis shows. So what are the headlines from the, uh, from the chapter in that case? Well, first off, COVID makes levelling up many times harder. So if you look at the nature of levelling up before we went into the pandemic, it was a very large task and the government rightly identified it in its, in its manifesto and indeed has spoken about it many times since. But that big task was, uh, was large and it was particularly an urban challenge as well. And that 80% of this challenge on the measure that we use was based within our cities and large towns. Since then, and accelerate forwards of 10 months to where we are now from where we were in March last year, that challenge has become at least four times harder of the increase in the number of people who are claiming unemployment related benefits and again that's a very urban problem you know if we look at the the four biggest cities in the north and mid sort of north midlands in scotland so birmingham glasgow newcastle and manchester they account for two-fifths of that challenge that's 40 percent of that challenge on their own just four places which shows how trying to get them firing again is going to be particularly important in both the post-covid world but also in terms of trying to level up but there's a new challenge now that's emerged that the government didn't have to contend with back in March. And that's an issue potentially of levelling down. So while, yes, the levelling up challenge has become four times harder, what we've also seen over the last 10 months is that those places that went into the pandemic being particularly prosperous have also been hit pretty hard too. And so places like Slough, Luton, Crawley, and the biggest one amongst them, London, have seen very large increases in their unemployment rate or in terms of their, their claim and count rate, um, but have also seen very large and continued usage of the government's furlough scheme too, which suggests that they're in a much more fragile place now than what they were in the past. And so what that then means is that the government's first task, levelling up, has become four times harder, but then a second task has emerged, which is actually about trying to deal with the fallout of COVID on some of our previously very successful and prosperous economies, and that this risk of potentially levelling down rather than levelling up. What does that then mean for policy? Well, what we've done, because clearly there are many things going on here, there's a COVID challenge and a levelling up challenge, is we split cities into four categories to try and sort of provide a framework for policymakers to think about what they should do in terms of policy. And so very briefly, those four buckets are starting top left. We've got places that had a levelling up challenge and now have a COVID challenge too, because they've been affected very hard by COVID. We don't think they're going to respond very quickly to or um, recover very quickly from COVID, but then have a levelling up challenge on top of that. And so we're talking about places such as Blackpool, Bradford, Glasgow, Newport and Sheffield. Then bottom left, the second category, we've got those places that face a levelling up challenge. So these are places that went into the pandemic in a fairly um, precarious position, but actually haven't been that hard hit by, by the recession and seem to have, have escaped the worst of it. And so they're places like, say, uh, Plymouth, Newcastle, Doncaster, where we think they will bounce back quite quickly, which is good news, but we do also note that in terms of bouncing back, we're still bouncing back to a position of relative weakness. We've then got places that have that went into the, kind of, into the recession in a fairly strong position, but now have a bit of a COVID challenge on their plates. That is places like Brighton, Leicester, we'll hear from, from Peter Sawsby later, and um, South End, for example, and the government's got a challenge there about how to deal with those prosperous places and get them back to onto the path of prosperity. And then finally, 
we've got a group of cities where we think probably most categorize this idea of a v-shaped recovery if we ever do see one of those that we think they haven't been very hit hard hit by the recession and actually we think they will bounce back quickly back to their previous position of strength too and will will continue to drive the economy on and so then we're talking about places like exeter milton Keynes, reading and york for example they're the categories but what then should we be doing in terms of policy? We know what should we do in terms of COVID and, and levelling up? Well, in terms of COVID, short term policies, that's very much about making sure that businesses and cities keep their head above water. And while we were continue to be in this position of, of lockdown and, and ongoing restrictions. And so that's then doing things like making the £20 increase in universal credit permanent, which is something that's been spoken about a lot. It's about extending the furlough scheme beyond April, as long as we've got social distancing places at S restrictions in place and it's bringing in a, a, a high street voucher not dislike the out to help out scheme when it's safe to do so again to get people out and spending in the economy moving again in terms of the longer term leveling up what do we then do about that well that's a focus on skills principally it's a focus on trying to improve city center economies and making them more attractive places to do business it's about uh, trying to improve transport infrastructure within our biggest cities not necessarily in our smaller places because we don't think that's going to be their number one priority. And then finally, it's about devolution. And that's about devolution of powers. It's about reorganisation of local government so it can make the most of those powers. And it's about freeing up local government to be able to spend its money in a much uh, easier and more effective way than it ca can currently do. Thank you very much. Back to you, Andrew. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed, um, Paul, for that very brief uh, overview. As Paul said, uh, there is much, much more in the report itself and on our website that you can uh, you can get your teeth um, into. But let's move to our first panel. I'm going to panelists to respond to what they've heard and indeed give it from their perspectives. Our first panel, my esteemed panelists are Abby Brown, leader of Stoke City Council, Sir Peter Salisbury, the mayor of Leicester, and Steve Rotherham, the mayor or the Metro Mayor of Liverpool city region so turning to you first abby give us the view from stoke hey thank you um and thank you for inviting me to be part of today's launch um i last spoke at launch in 2019 and it's not lost on me that the need for financial sustainability for local government is a headline recommendation in this year's report too as it was then plus a change um, financial sustainability goes hand in hand with um, reliability and I believe that this year, this last year has proved local government has that in spades. When national testing capacity was struggling last summer, Stoke-on-Trent City Council set up our own testing centres um, and today 25 members of uh, my officer team are currently in the critical care unit at the Royal Stoke Hospital carrying out non-clinical jobs so that the clinical staff can focus on their patients. I'm really proud to lead a can-do council, the small but mighty Stoke-on-Trent, where we pioneered um, mass community coronavirus testing through the use of lateral, lateral flow tests and most recently have been pitching to government around speeding up the vaccination process alongside our county colleagues. We really want as local government to use our expertise to help and advise co-production, something that local government is great at. And co-production for me is what surely must underpin the government's agenda for both COVID recovery and also levelling up. As the report suggests, Stoke-on-Trent has been relatively sheltered from COVID due to our high export base. So the challenge for us as a city really remains levelling up. And my response as leader of the City Council is delivered in parallel to that of COVID recovery. Again, as I said in 2019, if you don't want to manage decline, then economic growth has to be the answer. Homes, jobs, Businesses are all part of the solution, but they have to be part of our vision, not one that's been superimposed on us by other people. Prior to the pandemic, Stoke-on-Trent was the fastest growing economy by ways of job creation, something we intend to get back to. So levelling up remains our greatest challenge and opportunity too. And again, the recommendations of the Centre for Cities, Cities Outlook very much chimes with our view as a city around what we need to level up. Um, and levelling up is very much a hot topic in Stoke-on-Trent as it arrived at roughly the same time as two new Conservative MPs, which meant that we had for the first time in over 100 years a full sweep of a Conservative-led City Council and three Conservative MPs. And this would have been fairly unimaginable 10 years ago, but having fought my way here, I plan on continuing to change the narrative of my city through making an offer of partnership to the government alongside my three Conservative MPs that crosses a number of... Hello, Alex and agencies to retain the momentum that we've realized the progress we've made in recent years. 
organised across the four key pillars of transport, economic development, education skills and health and productivity. We focused on a range of products and schemes that build on the very best of Stoke-on-Trent, using targeted investments across a number of partners and making best use of the new fairer Treasury Green Book. The Stoke-on-Trent prospectus outlines how we will deliver economic growth through fostering high growth sectors, many already fledgling in our city, creating the high skilled, well paid jobs we need. How we will ensure our residents have the quality of education, health and skills needed to access the opportunities we believe our vision can deliver. We're already benefiting from a number of government schemes from Transforming Cities Fund to Opportunity Area, Housing Infrastructure Fund to a multi-million pound full fibre gigabit enabled network. We'll be HS2 connected and we want to maximise the opportunities of modal shift by improving our internal infrastructure to benefit our residents, businesses and the environment. Our hardworking and loyal workforce have transferred seamlessly from making cups and plates in moulds to supporting automation across advanced ceramics, specialist engineering and pharma science businesses. But we need to raise the general level of attainment. Our opportunity area status has started to address some of these disparities, but we believe we can do more as an education challenge area. One of our growth sectors as a city is digital, creative, but also technical. Staffordshire University, based in Stoke-on-Trent, is a world leader in e-games and we're currently installing full fibre right across our city. Our Silicon Stoke proposal will ensure we harness the absolute potential of this government investment in connecting up our schools, our residents and, of course, attracting a whole new generation to the city that brought forward Josiah Wedgwood. The success of our housing and industrial site growth speaks for itself. In 2019, we had more housing unit completions than the average London borough, delivering over 190% compared to the bar set in our housing delivery plan, and 97% of that was on Brownfield land too. Our Ceramic Valley Enterprise Zone is regarded as one of the most successful in the country, and we have swathes of Brownfield land, and as a local authority, the ambition and the ability to develop it with the support of the remediation funding. We're rebuilding our city centre and our town centres with our city centre Swiftfield development, showing how you can create a central business district with grade A office accommodation, high quality hotel provision and city centre living, which will soon be complemented by our development of the East West site, which is one of the largest city centre regeneration sites in the Midlands. As a city with no shortage of heritage assets, we're also currently working on a range of projects to see them brought into meaningful use both by ourselves and others who share our passion for Stoke-on-Trent. We're also looking at redevelopment around our Victorian trade station to complement and build on the success of our Transforming Cities Fund. We have plenty of our own skin in the game, but alongside support from government and other partners through our prospectus, this would be supercharged. As an ambitious leader, I've spent the last 10 months continuing to pursue in inward investment whilst ensuring we invest directly too. And I've got a number of exciting announcements I'm going to make over um, the coming weeks. But how can the government help me to make my plans a reality? I often jokingly say to my officers that my tactic in life is set to be so relentless in my approaches that I simply cannot be ignored. I spent the last five years seizing every opportunity to share with government how we're changing the narrative of Stoke-on-Trent. And I believe they've heard me. So my message today is that our Stoke-on-Trent prospectus will be landing on desks across government shortly, full of exciting but achievable plans to level up Stoke-on-Trent. And I am certainly up for the challenge, if the government are. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Abby. I'm exhausted just listening to all the various schemes and initiatives and ideas that you've uh, that you've got, never mind having to be the responsibility of delivering them. So thank you very much um, for that. Let's move to Leicester. Uh, so Peter, give us the view of what's going on in Leicester. Well, first of all, Andrew, thanks uh for inviting me along today. Uh, obviously, it's an important report. And uh, as you've, I think, said in the introduction, uh, the only one of its type and uh, something that I think gives us an opportunity to look at the leveling up agenda and also the particular uh, challenge that agenda that, uh, that COVID has brought. Um, obviously, in Leicester, we're in a fairly unique situation in that we've had the longest continuous restrictions of any city in the UK as a result of, uh, of COVID. Um, and that uh, has brought uh, particular challenges to the city. Uh, it has, I think, had a disproportionate effect on Leicester. And I think it's very appropriate that uh, in the report, you've identified Leicester as having a comparatively strong economy, fairly broad based economy, but one that has been particularly COVID challenged. And I think that's the right category in which to put us because uh, those challenges are very real indeed. But certainly, uh, 
speaking because I am, of course, from the East Midlands, uh, you know, we're aware that uh, even pre-COVID, there were very significant challenges in the levelling up agenda, uh, not least, of course, in the uh, investment spending per head uh, in different parts of the UK, with uh, us here in the East Midlands receiving uh, mere £621 per head uh, in investment compared with the uh, £1,456 per head in, in London. And uh, those disparities uh, already pronounced uh, have, uh, I think, been exacerbated by the new challenges that, uh, that COVID has brought to us. So I want very quickly uh, to run through just uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the issues that are, are highlighted in the report and uh, perhaps uh, to comment briefly on them. Um, so I'm going to do eight, but I will do them very quickly. The, the, the first is the economic uh, impact and uh, our... Uh, feeling that uh, very clearly coming through the report is the need for support for employment, boosting for the high street uh, and uh, access to uh, SMEs particularly to get uh, business support funding. I think there is also the secondly the issue of transport and uh, we in the East Midlands again have been uh, significantly underfunded for transport investment uh, compared with uh, with other reason, uh, regions. Uh, investment uh, in uh, London, again, uh, to make the comparison, is two and a half times higher uh, than, uh, than the rest of the UK and even more for the uh, East Midlands, which comes right at the bottom of the table. Third issue I wanted to briefly to touch on is, uh, is housing. And uh, while, of course, uh, we're, uh, in a sense, uh, pleased to see the government's commitment to increasing housing targets, uh, we're well aware that if cities like Leicester are to... Uh, respond positively to the need for increased investment in housing, we need government support for that. Uh, and a clear development fund closing the viability gap uh, to allow us to build housing at a pace to respond to the challenge. The fourth area from the report to talk on is uh, that of uh, investment in commercial workspace and offices. And uh, again, a recognition that uh, our industrial workspace development in the city is vitally important to us, but not immediately commercially viable. And uh, we need the gap funding that allows that development potential to be unlocked. Unlike Stoke, we don't have the vast areas of, uh, uh, of brownfield land, but what we do have are many exciting opportunities if only we were able to fund the gap between the costs of development uh, and, uh, and, and, and the need that, they will, that it will meet. The fifth area quickly to talk on is uh, that of social care and, uh, and health and uh, of course the extent to which Covid has exacerbated job insecurity and, and health issues uh, and the extent to which we, like other local authorities, are challenged by uh, the need to continue to devote an increasing proportion of our expenditure into, into social care in general and adult social care in particular and the challenges that brings to us uh, as a local council, but also as a nation. The sixth item to, uh, to, to, to mention is the, uh, the needs of education and the need for a skilled and motivated work, uh, workforce uh, and, and the recognition uh, that the disruptive impact that COVID has had on school pupils is something that uh, is uh, going to be ongoing and is going to need very considerable local and national inputs uh, in the future particularly uh, in urban areas such as Leicester. Seventh area to, uh, to refer to is of course uh, looking beyond the, uh, uh, the primary and secondary education and to investment in skills uh, and uh, research and development. We're very fortunate here in, uh, in Leicester to have two uh, excellent universities within the city and uh, Loughborough University very nearby uh, and to recognise that uh, they too uh, have a an important role in uh, promoting the the, the levelling up um, across the uh, across the UK, uh, and a recognition that uh, at the moment uh, investment in uh, uh, in R and D uh, in the East Midlands uh, is uh, amongst the very lowest in in the UK, and investment in those universities and all the R and D that is associated with them has to be a priority. And the final point that I want to make is that, of course, uh, we, like other uh, urban local authorities, uh, have now had a decade of, uh, of, of cuts in our revenue expenditure. We um, 
uh, depending on quite how you estimate it, ha have lost uh, spending power of between 100 million and 150 million pounds per year. Uh, on, uh, on, on providing vital local service, services, local services that have been called on dramatically during the period of, uh, of uh, a lockdown, in our case, a very extended period of lockdown, and have been put under considerable stress. And I think like uh, other urban councils, we are saying to the government that uh, the services we provide have uh, shown how vital they are during uh, the COVID crisis and uh, are under enormous stress as we come out of it and need to be uh, properly funded. Uh, and we do need to see a recognition that uh, that, that funding is something that, uh, that needs, insofar as it is possible to do so, uh, to be restored, to enable us to do the job that the people of our cities uh, expect of us. Uh, I say a very quick run through there, the, uh, the priorities uh, for us uh, coming from this report, but I do very much welcome it. Thank you it very much. It is something that is uh, both uh, comprehensive uh, and uh, very much up to date and uh, and very relevant to us. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank you very much indeed, um, Sir Peter. A lot again in there to uh, to unpack and to, to reflect on, not just today, but uh, over the coming uh, weeks as well. Let's turn to our third member of the first panel, and that is Steve Rotherham. Steve is the Metro Mayor from Liverpool City Region. Steve, good to have you with us. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for inviting me to the launch of what is a really important report, and it's both very informative and an analytical perspective on levelling up from a national perspective, but which chimes really well with what we're doing in the Liverpool City region and what we've been undertaking over the last three and a half years. And unfortunately, within that, you'll see that two of our regions, towns and cities are high on the scale of uh, pre-pandemic need. You know, Liverpool was eighth and Birkenhead was 21st. But the report highlights that the situation that we now face is five times more challenging than it was just 12 months ago. Uh, and from our uh, perspective, Liverpool, uh, of course, has been greatly impacted by COVID, uh, Baconhead less so, um, but so have the other four areas that make up the Liverpool city region and the 1.6 million people that I represent. So we need uh, an equal opportunity to level up across our own patch, um, as well as leveling up in different areas throughout the country. And indeed, you know, Liverpool, is the fifth most impacted in terms of the need to level up post COVID of all the cities following the report. Um, and that's a real challenge to us, but I, I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, and I believe that the city and the city region's economy is more resilient now than at any time during the last three or four or five decades. So we will bounce back and we'll bounce back more quickly than some cities and city regions. Uh, as soon as those restrictions are, are relaxed. And that's due primarily to the pull of our brand and our cultural offer. But our other local authorities um, still need the certainty that Liverpool needs of funding. And it's just been mentioned by the previous two speakers that, you know, sustainability of our councils, given that they have been at the front um, of this challenge that we've had with COVID uh, and done some sterling work that needs to be recognised um, and we need to get away from, you know, a failed decade of austerity. So locally we intend to really study the recommendations in the report and look very carefully on what we can take on board as soon as possible because the emphasis now here is about hitting the ground running when we get to recovery. So, for instance, we've already begun to implement strategies for a post-pandemic, post-Brexit world. And in terms of our response to the economic challenges that we'll face in the future, and certainly of the last 10 months or so, we've already published our LCR recovery plan. It was in June last year. And the focus was to build back better, not just the soundbite, but to actually do that. And it's been described by a government minister as the most ambitious that he'd seen. Uh, but central to all of that is our plan for the creation of a, a fair and more socially just city region. And as part of that, we're launching our fair employment charter next month. We also want to harness the opportunities of the green economy 
and I want us to become Britain's renewable energy coast. And I think we can do that with tidal power being well developed now. And we've been working as a city region alongside Greater Manchester with Andy Burnham to ensure that we in the Northwest take full advantage of the UK's role as host of COP26 later in the year. And all of that is alongside what we're doing here. And I want to help as many local businesses, of course, create profit, but through operating with purpose. And we've been promoting all of that through something called the Good Business Festival to international claim, it must be said, which is really about how you can do things more locally differently. And with, him, with all of that in mind, we're going to be launching our latest round of grant support and something called our Future Innovation Fund later in the year. And all of this is all about local, locally levelling up so that we can lead when it comes to trying to persuade governments of what they need to do. But the city region's economy, as we all know, has been forged through a history of industry. It's been reimagined and recreated by culture. And despite everything that's happened, I still believe that it's standing on the verge of a future inspired by entrepreneurialism, by ambition and by creative curiosity. And the recovery plan I've, I've told you about is made up of a load of projects which individually represent transformational opportunities for people, for places, for communities and sectors across the city region, but collectively and cumulatively um, they offer UK PLC a chance to regain some of the lost market shares that we've had over the last um, few years. And really this is down to now, uh, Andrew, the report and how government really levels up. It, it is um, to give areas with global expertise, with competitive advantages, but to help them by providing support to realise their full potential and that will then help to flatten out the regional disparities um, that we've seen. But we need that funding and support. And it's why I believe that further devolution is so important to the whole country. We've got it, but we believe other areas should have it because you can do things better with local knowledge and understanding. So the overarching message uh, underpinning our strategy is one of hope and confidence for the future. And by aiming for a, a people-first focused recovery, we can offer hope to those who are out of work. We can offer support to our business ecosystem to innovate, grow and thrive. We can put the fight for a better environment at the heart of everything that we do. We can make things more socially just, and that's what we intend to do. So just to finish off, um, what we all need now, and you've just heard it with three different presentations, is recognition from the government that to increase economic prosperity in places such as the Liverpool city region, uh, despite it being a decades long challenge, then ministers need to intervene on multiple fronts. And I've highlighted some of those, but we stand ready and willing to work with national governments because that's the only way in which we can change local areas but improve the whole of the UK. Brilliant. Thank Same you very thing. much indeed, uh, Steve, and indeed to Abby and, and Sir Peter as well. Lots of common themes. We've got a couple of minutes literally for um, for a few questions. We've had quite a few in already on, on different themes, but, but very much one of the strong themes actually was something you just touched on right at the end there, Steve, um, which was about... You know, you're doing an awful lot. Uh, you've, you know, you've outlined all of the things that you're doing, and yet there is a you know a demand for more power, more responsibilities from from government. I mean, what what can local leaders do in order to convince government that you know devolution is the way forward? It's not a giving up of power; it's a sharing of power. Abby, you give us your thought on on that. I mean, what more can we do at the the local level to to give confidence to the government if they need it that devolution is is a good thing and that they sh they should you know they should kick start it again, Abby. I guess it probably is conversations like this, isn't it? And, and a reminder of some of the, the smaller things that happen that we take so much for granted. So um, um, I was talking to the Secretary of State at the end of last year about the, the figure I quoted earlier. Um, you know, 
190% overall housing delivery plan. We've produced more housing units in the last year than the average London borough and 97% on brownfield land. And he did a bit of a double take then. Um, you know, he, he knows my city well. He knows the challenges that I have as the leader. Uh, but he also recognises that that is an absolutely stupendous achievement. And I think when you can quantify it with success on things like that, then that really means something, doesn't it? So I think it is incumbent on us as leaders of local government to talk about where we are making those successes. Excellent. Very good. Um, Peter, your, your reflection on that in a sense, you know, what, what can we do more if, if they need more convincing? What is it that we can do? You're on mute. Apologize. Yeah, I mean, ironically, I mean, it's one, it's one of the messages that's come out from the uh, COVID crisis, actually, is the extent to which uh, it is uh, local areas, uh, local councils, uh, mayors who uh, are uh, better placed to understand their local communities than, uh, than centralised uh, government and uh, the approach that they've adopted. And certainly, I think we've uh, demonstrated throughout the crisis that uh, we at a local level have a better understanding and a better ability to uh, to intervene. And I hope that uh, you know those messages have been taken in the context of COVID, but I hope they're ones that will be learned from COVID and, and applied more generally. Yeah. And certainly, you know, issues like, you know, the way in which track and trace has, uh, has worked at a, at a national level, uh, compared with the way in which uh, we've been able to deliver it at a local level, and we're the only local authority, I think, that has the uh, responsibility for track and trace within our area. We've demonstrated we can do it far, far better than it we've done nationally. And that message applies to so much more, uh, but uh, is one to be learned now, and I hope carried on into the future. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Steve, similar question to you, I suppose. I mean, since you talked about delivery, about getting things done, you know, what else is there? What else, how else can we convince government that devolution is not them giving away power and then worrying about what happens? It's actually, you know, it benefits not only you, but actually it benefits the country at large. Steve? Thanks, Andrew. You've heard me saying this before, but we are the most centralised democracy in the OECD and we have the most unbalanced economy in the whole of Europe. So something needs to happen if we are to truly level up. And we've had these, if you like, pilot schemes. We've been testing stuff out for three and a half years with devolution in the West Midlands, you know, in Greater Manchester, in the Liverpool City region, etc. So we've got a model there that we can look at. Now, the people that we need to convince of this are not just, uh, if you like, the policymakers. They are also the people who hold, who hold the purse strings and, and that's why, you know, I, I talk to government ministers and, and, you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and even the Prime Minister and say, have a look at what we're doing. And if we're not giving you a bigger bang for your book, take away the funding. But I can demonstrate that we are. So we are getting more out of the same amount of money because we can act more nimbly locally and we can respond, as Peter just said, it's about delivery. We can be much more... Uh, delivery focused and we can respond much more quickly than a national monolith can if you wanted an example of it have a look what happened with test and trace have a look what happened with ppe have a look what happened with a lot of the issues on covid such as mass testing it was local areas that came to the fore give us our head work with us don't abandon us work with us and you'll get a bigger return for your investment brilliant thank you very much indeed um Let's move on, because I, I, unfortunately, time is, uh, is always pressing, uh, not least. So thank you very much to my panel. Uh, but we also have a man with his fingers on the, the purse strings. Uh, we are joined today by the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, the Right Honourable Jesse Norman, a fan of uh, Mr. Burke and indeed Mr. Smith. Good combination to think about how the economy and politics come together. Jesse, it's lovely to have you uh, with us. Um, Give us your thoughts on what you've heard so far. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew. And uh, thanks also to the speakers we've had. I thought they were three really interesting uh, presentations. And they highlight uh, the dynamism and the energy of uh, local government and of the devolved uh, powers that have been granted. And I think that's a very powerful lesson uh, overall. Uh, and thank you also to the Centre for Cities for uh, inviting me to take part. Uh, I've read the report with some detail and uh, and care, and uh, I think it's a very uh, useful contribution uh, as we help to think about the interaction between the challenges of, on the one hand, delivering uh, the agenda to level up the country, and on the other hand, to uh, support everyone, uh, businesses and families and people as we recover from 
coronavirus. As you will be aware, uh, I've had a lot of interest in city issues for many years. Uh, I, when I was at Policy Exchange many years ago, I uh, uh, edited a book called Living for the City, uh, not tragically a, 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 um, a appraisal or a criticism of great songs by Stevie Wonder, but uh, looking at interesting ways of greening the city uh, in a 21st century way. And I've been involved with the Roundhouse in London, big piece of urban regeneration in Camden Town. And in Hereford, where I'm the MP, I'm very de deeply involved in the regeneration we're doing of that city through our pioneering higher education project, uh, the new model in technology and engineering, trying to reimagine uh, higher education and further education, how they join for engineering and technology, and, and also more recently with the Stronger Towns Fund, which I think has been a really useful and interesting initiative. And uh, I know towns aren't the same thing as cities, although they come pretty close in Hereford, um, Andrew, but I hope you'll think about uh, looking at the STF, because I think it's a very interesting uh, potential set of lessons coming out of that over the next few years. Now, why are we here? We're here because we all care about cities, so we think they're really uh, important. And of course, uh, we're here because we recognize that cities are not just great places to uh, live, um, but also great places to work and to visit. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the, you know, history doesn't have many straightforward lessons, but one of them is that strong cities are the engines of uh, economic growth and development. Uh, acting as hubs for competition uh, and also um, as ways, you know, breeding grounds for ideas and innovation. I thought Steve was absolutely right to highlight the importance of culture uh, and the arts. And of course, that's been a fantastic theme for Liverpool over many years. He and I were on the Culture Media and Sport Committee um, some years ago, and I could see his passion for that there. And I think that and education, those areas of culture and arts and education heritage are going to become even more important as we think about how cities develop over the next uh, few years. Now, uh, I think it's fair to say that until March of last year, we were witnessing a resurgence uh, of uh, our cities and uh, over a, a couple of decades and uh, or more in some cases. But uh, as your report highlights, uh, many have been hard hit by the uh, pandemic and you will be aware everyone on this call, everyone on this Zoom will be aware of the scale of the efforts that we've made in government to protect people's jobs and livelihoods and to support both businesses and public services uh, during uh, this dreadful pandemic. Uh, and uh, you pick on some, uh, uh, you've got some city uh, mayors and council leaders uh, with you. Let me just say, uh, and Abby said it better than me, but in Stoke-on-Trent, the government supported over 38,000 jobs through the furlough scheme and given over 170 million pounds or granted over 170 million pounds in support for business loans uh, in Greater Manchester. The numbers are for 400,000 jobs and over 2.6 billion pounds in uh, loans. So there's a tremendous amount of support, a very front foot uh, posture from central government uh, as we try and support people and businesses and livelihoods uh, across uh, the country in cities of every imaginable size. Now, of course, that raises challenges, and some of those challenges are, are, are intellectual challenges. Uh, one of them is you get this, which is, look, with technology enabling millions of people to work from home, uh, do we really need, some people would say, do we actually need cities? Are cities a, as it were, 20th century and not a 21st century phenomenon? And uh, even if there are cities, will there be a mass movement out of them? And I have to say, I think this is extremely unlikely, and uh, I feel... Uh, I channel Rotheramic optimism about the possibilities for our cities uh, uh, as I look around the country. Um, I mean, just to take a simple example, I mean, London as a city had recurrent parts of a, of, of a, of a disease considerably worse than COVID, even the, uh, the plague uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, that did not stop its growth. On the contrary, it was growing like topsy. And uh, it continues to do so. And people evolved ways of dealing where they could with the disease. And um, uh, this, thank God, is nothing like that. Uh, but uh, this pandemic deserves to be and demands to be taken uh, very seriously. But I do not think it means the end of cities. The policy questions for us are how cities are going to grow, how they're going to grow, not whether they're going to grow, and how we can support them. We in the private sector, we as a government can support them. Uh, now, the pandemic may have taught us, in other words, that uh, we can work from home, but it's also reminded us how much we value face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, and uh, I think it's not impossible that we find that cities and indeed human contact as such, and the human contact they give us, 
uh, that they are more important than ever as we come out of this present crisis. Uh, at, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a, the perspective that you're thinking of, of, of investment, one of the real world consequences may be that it gives us a chance to, as the, as the phrase goes, build back better. And as you all know, we have an urban recovery task force which is going to be considering the impacts of COVID over the short and the medium term, precisely with a goal to identifying emerging opportunities um, to uh, turbocharge uh, future development in areas such as housing or planning and, and regeneration. But we're also thinking about the longer term vision. And you may have seen that before Christmas, uh, uh, we recently published the National Infrastructure Strategy uh, and that will be further developed in a, a white paper that is coming on devolution and local recovery. Now, the infrastructure strategy really does repay your attention. I would encourage anyone on the call to read it. It, it argues, essentially, that a well-designed uh, public transport network is fundamental to the operation of any city. It recognises that. And then it goes further to talk about how we from central government will be investing uh, in those uh, networks uh, over time. Uh, and that. Uh, we know that uh, transportation infrastructure and, of course, skills are both going to be fundamental to critical to driving future economic growth uh, and competitiveness. Uh, if we take the, the scale of the investment that's underway, um, you will be aware we have the Transforming Cities Fund, multiple billions of pounds. We have a, uh, a share that's been we've announced of the five billion pounds uh, that's going towards uh, supporting buses and cycling over this parliament. Eight city regions will also benefit from 4.2 billion pounds worth of government investment in local transport. Um, and all of this isn't just happening in one year, as it were, wadges. It's happening uh, as part of five year funding settlements uh, starting in 2022. And that's precisely designed to give local authorities, to give mayoralties, to give people in and around urban development in cities and towns the chance to plan and following uh, the approach uh, that, that we've had with London we've and also it should be said with the with the road investment strategy um, we will be uh, uh, not just putting in place five-year settlements that's the lesson of RIS uh, but also doing it with uh, in the case of this development funding the uh, support and the agreement of and indeed the management of elected mayors, that is the people who are closest to their cities uh, and transport systems as we recognize. But we've also announced plans uh, in outline to set up a new national infrastructure bank. Uh, that will be uh, a new institution headquartered in the north of England, uh, which will support private infrastructure projects across the UK and help us to meet our public objectives on economic growth, uh, leveling up and the transition to net uh, zero. So the bank will be able to lend to local and uh, mayoral authorities uh, and it will also uh, be able to uh, support uh, the, uh, infrastructure projects regionally uh, uh, with uh, advice and assistance to those authorities on how they develop and finance projects because often it's the project development stage that's the part of the infrastructure creation process that goes under recognized. Now, as you know, we've got eight Metro mayors already uh, elected across the country with a ninth in, in West Yorkshire planned uh, for this year. That means that many of our major city regions are already benefiting from significant government investment uh, and, of course, the devolution of important local powers uh, across transport and planning and uh, skills. Uh, and as part of that, we've committed £7.5 billion of an unring fenced gain share investment over 30 years for these mayoral combined authorities, which are designed to be spent on local priorities. And that, of course, goes alongside city and growth deals, uh, which provide local areas with the powers and funding they need to take forward economic priorities. I note that about £3 billion of the UK government investment uh, is committed to 20 city growth deals that cover all of uh, Scotland, uh, Wales and uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, as I've said, we've got a devolution in local recovery white paper coming. That will set out how the government uh, is planning to partner with places across the country in order to build a sustainable economic uh, recovery. But of course, uh, change, economic recovery, development, transformation, uh, that is not going to happen unless there's also a change of culture. Uh, and uh, it was touched on by Abby earlier, and we can uh, discuss it further, but you will have seen that there has been a Green Book 
review, yes. designed to create a fairer uh, intellectual approach towards leveling up um, and perhaps uh, uh, recognize factors alongside the classic focus on benefit cost ratios. Uh, and the government's also announced that uh, it will be relocating thousands of civil service roles out of London to cities and towns across the country. And those things are both major changes, which I think will have big cultural, long-term cultural implications. Uh, uh, if I say that we've also uh, done considerable work through the Infrastructure Projects Authority and working alongside the National Infrastructure Commission to improve the way in which projects are delivered, the quality of the delivery, then uh, I'm sure you'll understand how important that is. Hell, we've even got into ministerial training. I've got three cohorts of my colleagues who have now gone through a ministerial training program. That's a, that's a first for the UK and 800 years of government. And that is designed to make ministers in, into better clients, better uh, able to scrutinize and ask questions uh, about um, how projects are progressing and how they can be improved and brought in uh, on time, on specification and on budget. Now, uh, Andrew, I don't need to tell you where this is Burns Day, Burns Night this evening, and uh, uh, I've got the pleasure of doing an adjournment debate, so I won't be joining the festivities. Um, but you'll know it was Robbie Burns who said that the best laid plans of mice and men gang aft aglay, which I think he means um, often go wrong. What's not quite as well known, as he also said, the best laid plans have a better chance of succeeding if they're properly managed by project professionals subject to bipartisan and intelligent political leadership. And I look forward to reading, I look forward to reading Robbie well, quite. The, the undiscovered Robbie Burns manuscripts when these things become true. At the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all want vibrant, prosperous, sustainable cities. That's not something we're going to get in a few years. We've got no. mayors who have seen their cities transformed um, over more than a few years, but nevertheless transformed. This is the vision, the commitment we have. And I think if we work together and if we work with the dynamism in the best parts of the mayoralties and local authorities, then we can match that and remake our cities for uh, a new post-COVID era. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. We, we're, again, time is tight, but I, one question to you. Um, it's the flip side, I suppose, of the question I put to panel one, which is, you know, what is it that local leaders need to give you as a government and obviously as a member of HMT to give you the confidence to go further on what you've been talking about, which is devolution and significant investment and resource. Just give me a give me a 30 second sort of. Yeah, of course. Know, let, let me tell you, I actually think this is one of the reasons why I like the Stronger Towns Fund. I think the Stronger Towns Fund is a really good template because what it does is it essentially nudges towns to get together a, 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 a cross fertilizing steering group between the independent, voluntary and private sectors and the council in that case, um, to put together a long-term plan and to make it a, a bipartisan thing with a lot of consultation that everyone signs up to. And I think once you have that, yeah. then government knows that it can survive political change. Then government knows that it's been well consulted on and well engaged. And it knows, almost inevitably, it knows that that level of consultation is going to involve lots of ideas and lots of energy. And so personally, those are the things that I always find deeply exciting. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if those are the kinds of things that other ministers, although I can't speak for them and we're in the lee of a budget and all that stuff, um, yeah. uh, will continue to look for as we go forward. Lovely. OK, uh, Minister, as I said, thank you very much for your thoughts and for being involved in the event today. Let's, hear, let's move to panel two and then they have the advantage of having listened to you. They can respond to that. Let me introduce my um, my second panel. My panelists are Judith Blake, leader of Leeds City Council, chair of Core Cities UK and soon to be a member of the House of Lords. Judith, welcome. Uh, Rajesh Agrawal, Deputy Mayor of London with specific responsibility for business and business matters. And Andy Burnham, uh, Metro Mayor of Greater Manchester. That's panel two. You've heard from our first panel. You've heard from uh, our financial uh, secretary. Same format as before, few, a few minutes of your thoughts and then we'll squeeze in a couple of questions. Judith, kick us off. Uh, thank you so much, um, Andrew. Re really great to be here today and hear all of the speakers and I, I and can I really extend as well a, a warm welcome to the report itself. A lot of food for thought and a lot of really important analysis about where we actually are and um, also the impact of COVID as it is starting to emerge. 
I, um, I think the, the really important message that we want to get over today is that as leaders of um, cities, we see ourselves very much as part of the solution going forward uh, and, and really, um, really well placed to um, understand the impact of COVID, um, not only on our economies, but on the people that we represent. And as you say, I'm the chair of Core Cities, um, you know, a huge um, part of the e economy, 26% of the UK economy driven from core cities, 20 million people um, accountable for 20% of exports and home to 40% of our university population. So we're today focusing on intervention needed by government and previous speakers have covered this um, a great deal, but I, I do want to emphasize as um, leader of the second largest city outside of London, just the impact on um, council budgets and how they've been decimated by the pandemic. And the government really does need to um, honor its commitment to supporting those um, council budgets so that we can play our full part um, in the recovery programs. Um, obviously, we've talked about um, need for investment in skills and retraining and job creation, investment in public transport must be honoured and continued, um, and there needs to be more devolution. And whilst um, I think um, Jesse sort of made a good story about devolution, we're in the foothills of the devolution program if we're really going to make it what it needs to be. We don't have real devolution in this country and that we need to focus far more on how we can get the fiscal powers necessary down to local level. Um, and we must have the city centre productivity fund. But running through all of this, and this is a program that I've been proud to lead from Leeds and through Core Cities, um, is it's never been more important than to focus on the inclusive growth aspects. We need to focus on people. We need to understand the devastation that has been caused to individuals, to families, um, and um, just the basic resilience of our population. Um, we, we talk a lot about the impact of mental health of, on the crisis. Um, we need to understand that public health is, should be as it is uh, run through local government, but it shouldn't be sort of subject to, um, to cuts that it's seen over the last 10 years. The public health uh, agenda should be being boosted from all sides at the moment. And, and um, as we've heard, so many aspects that deliver for, for um, mental health and better outcomes through our cultural programs, through retraining, through a recalibration of opportunity. Um, and um, also important in this is recognizing the opportunities that we have through our response to us all declaring climate emergency. And that has to be at the forefront of everything that we're doing. So Leeds has, um, uh, is, you know, we, we are very fortunate that in a sense that we entered the um, pandemic from a relative position of strength, but we've been hit hard as have so many other places by, um, through the pandemic. Um, we um, estimate that about 25 and a half thousand people were, were furloughed in Leeds in October. That has already gone up to an estimated 50,000. Our universal credit claimants, whether for people in work or out of work, have increased by 96% from March 2020 to November 2020. And most worrying, of course, is the impact on young people and youth unemployment. Doubling is something that we should all be very um, yeah. concerned about. So the levelling up agenda um, really does need um, to be um, based on collaboration and not competition. Um, and, you know, one of the main reasons, and I was one of the main proponents for a mayor for the whole of Yorkshire and not um, for separate mayors, was that now more than any point, it's time for us to really come together and recognize our different strengths, the different ways that um, we can understand it at a local level. And I count Yorkshire as being a local level, how we can really um, understand where the investment is strong still, where we can come together, 
have that connectivity and the strengths. So uh, funding is obviously critical and it must be seen as an investment, uh, not a handout, so that we can really um, fulfill our potential and really contribute to rebalancing, not just the economies of our local areas, um, but all um, uh, the whole of um, the United Kingdom. So long-term fair financial settlements, more substantial de devolution, as I've said. Importantly, um, local control of UK, UK shared prosperity fund. I understand government has already made the decision that this will be um, coming down to us through local authorities and not through LEPs, which is an interesting development um, for us. Mm. But I think the, um, the virus has been quite cruel in the way that it has exposed our weaknesses, uh, whether it's around inequalities, whether it's around the death rates as has been announced today, much higher amongst the low paid, the disproportionate impact on, on women, um, for example, and just the basic systemic faults that are hold our nation back. We have an opportunity to really analyze what they are and come together um, to make sure that we address those underlying issues holding us back. So I would count low productivity, deprivation, low skills level and poor air quality amongst those. Growth obviously mm -hmm. is a major way through this. And I think cities and our city regions are very well placed to pick up the opportunities, the challenge and help us move forward together. Fantastic, thank you very much indeed, uh, Judith, for reminding us of the challenges in our cities within them as well as between them, but also that they are places that can offer a solution and a way uh, forward, not just for those places, but for the government as well and the country as a whole. Rajesh, give us the, the view from, uh, from London. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and to, uh, thanks to Centre for Cities for inviting me to join today. I would like to start by congratulating Cities for uh, Centre for Cities on this so, such a timely report. While we all know that the pandemic has had a devastating impact on our economy, it has been extremely interesting to read the figures on how this has impacted the regions specifically across the country. As the report rightly pointed out, London has appeared to be amongst the areas hardest hit by the pandemic. COVID has had a devastating impact on businesses and livelihoods with the latest figures in London showing the largest increase in unemployment in at least 30 years. Since the pandemic, the mayor and I have been working extremely closely with London boroughs and the business community to lobby the ministers on key gaps in the government's uh, economic support package, as well as keeping London's small business community up to date with the latest restrictions and supporting businesses. We launched a new support hub for struggling small businesses, helping them to survive the dual impacts of COVID-19 and Brexit. Over 2,700 businesses have been supported on a one-to-one -one basis by uh, this uh, business hub advisors. Uh, we provided 1.6 million pounds funding through the Mayor's Successful Paid Forward uh, scheme and 2.3 million pounds through our Culture at Risk Fund to help some of the London's most uh, at-risk creative and nighttime businesses. Uh, we allocated also 11 million pounds uh, to help the city's skills providers shift to online learning and training, including specific measures designed to reach Londoners who are currently less able to access online courses. We've also been working closely with a cross section of partners on a roadmap to, uh, to a safe and full reopening of London's economy and a recovery program for the capital to meet the grand challenge to restore confidence in our city, uh, minimize the impact on communities and build back better the city's economy and society. Building London back from this pandemic is intrinsically linked to the leveling up agenda. There cannot be any UK recovery from COVID-19 without a strong London recovery to drive it. London's economy is not isolated from the rest of the country. It's linked by complex relationship of trade, 
people, finance, and ideas. Last week, uh, you may have seen the uh, mayor's article in the Financial Times on the impact of the government's trade deal on the financial services sector. It is a myth that only those who work in the square mile in the Canary Wharf benefit from this sector. In reality, fewer than four in 10 who work in financial services do so in Greater London. Nearly 100,000 pounds, uh, 100,000 jobs are in the Northwest and 75,000 are in the uh, Yorkshire and uh, Humber region. The government must do more to support London as well as other regions across the country to ensure that we are ready to kickstart the economy and deliver our recovery program once restrictions are eased. The UK and London will need a fiscal package in order to stimulate demand. In London, we have a list of shovel ready projects which uh, we can get going and help boost the economy subject to government funding. Uh, if London is, help, uh, is to help uh, drive the UK's recovery and emerge with a cleaner, more sustainable and egalitarian city, we must also have a greater say over our own affairs. The delayed devolution white paper is an opportunity to begin this process and put into action policies that reflect the wording in the government's own manifesto. The days of Whitehall knows best are over. We know uh, what works for our businesses and our local communities. And so we should be given the devolution of powers, people and money to deliver that. It is crucial that London is provided with the funding and support that we need to respond to the immediate demands of the pandemic, whilst also uh, helping to build towards uh, longer term recovery and continuing to lead the UK in the post uh, COVID-19 world. Rajesh, thank you very much indeed, reminding us that whilst our cities are different in many ways, there are many things, many similarities that bring them together, not least uh, a consistent demand, not only for those that are on the call today, but actually cities across the country, that more devolution is a critical component of the levelling up uh, agenda as it emerges and evolves over the uh, months and years ahead. Uh, our third uh, member of this panel too is Andy Burnham. Andy, if you're there, I think you are, uh, share your thoughts with us. Good to have you. Thanks, uh, thanks Andrew. Uh, good to see, uh, see, see you as, as well and listen to all of the great contributions. Um, it's um, a well-timed uh, intervention from the Centre for Cities today. Um, as Judas was saying, um, COVID has shone an unforgiving spotlight uh, on the country um, and has ruthlessly um, attacked some of our weaknesses. And I think what we've got to face up to is the seriousness of the situation that we are in. Um, when we begin to lay our plans for recovery. Before I get into some of that, I think though let's hold to a positive. I listen carefully to what, what Jesse was saying. Devolution of power out of Westminster seems to be one thing around which there is a genuine consensus. That you can't say that about many other things really in politics right now, but there does appear to be a genuine consensus. I, I believe we've got to go with that and then really make it real and, and, and drive it um, and put in place uh, the, the powers and the funding to, to drive recovery uh, from the bottom up, uh, very much led by the city regions as Rajesh was just, uh, was just uh, saying. And that seems to me to be the prerequisite for uh, a recovery, um, which, which to be honest with you, given if you read what you've said today, is a much bigger task, it's a gargantuan task, to be honest. Um, I'm probably more serious than we've, we, we, we've uh, realized. Um, the damage to the regional economy is more profound um, than, than I think is, is understood. Uh, furlough is probably masking um, the, um, the issue uh, at, uh, at the moment. And I think it's going to need us to unlock the energy of people at every level uh, to, to get uh, recovery uh, going in the right, right way. So we are certainly in a serious economic uh, situation, Andrew. But I also want to point colleagues to the intervention from Gordon Brown today, because Gordon is talking about the 
the political strain, if you like, of, of the virus and the way in which a fairly centralized response has strained uh, relationships between the nations of the UK, but also within those nations, the relationship in England, particularly between the center and the regions. You know, we just have to be honest about that. Uh, it, it has uh, strained things. And Gordon is, in my view, rightly warning about uh, a choice of a reform state or a, or a failed uh, state. It is that serious now, given where, where we are, that the, the trust isn't there in the Westminster and Whitehall system to fix everything. It never has done. So, so why would it uh, now? It, it can't be the agent of levelling up because it's created the uneven country in which we all we all live. So something different is clearly needed uh, if levelling up is, is to be uh, a reality. And I, and I just say to the government, we do need to work together now to put real meaning behind that phrase, uh, levelling up. Uh, it can't be done by promises of, of infrastructure just scattered randomly around the country. Levelling up has to start in the poorest communities with people improving their homes, improving their work, uh, and improving uh, their their environment. I, I will forever be fairly haunted, to be honest, by uh, a BBC News report on Burnley that, um, that, that appeared uh, just before Christmas. There were levels of poverty there that I think we, we've never seen in our lifetimes in this uh, country. And let's remember, Burnley went under restrictions at the same time as Greater Manchester in the middle of last year. And that has had a grinding effect on some of our, our poorest, uh, poorest communities. And it, it, it was pointed out to me at the time, Greater Manchester, East Lancashire, West Yorkshire, this, this was the footprint that went under restrictions that was the same footprint of the government in which I served, um, a housing pathfinder project, if people may, may remember that. That was the last failed attempt to level up those communities top down. It didn't work then, and it isn't going to work now. You can only level up bottom up, uh, in my in my view, and and I think that is a lesson now that, that Whitehall has to take on board, and indeed all of the political parties in Westminster have to take uh, take on board. You, we we need now to see a major transfer of power and resources into the English regions to to give us the chance of making uh, levelling up a real, a real programme. The first thing we've got to do is in some ways stop the levelling down, because as the report tells us today, the problem is getting uh, bigger. Um, we're, we're going in the wrong direction, particularly in the Midlands and the North. And there are instant things that can be done that the report points to around universal credit and, and, and other things. But as Judith was just saying, you cannot level up on fractured foundations of local government facing even more cuts uh, from, from April. Manchester City Council, um, very much like, uh, like Judith, they are currently consulting on 50 million pounds of cuts uh, in financial year 21-22. Uh, now, uh, you know, last week they were dealing with floods, they're dealing with a pandemic. Now, how are councils going to, going to begin to level up if the foundations of the, of the council are, are being eroded from beneath their, their, their feet. It, it won't happen. So I do say to Jesse and the government, shoring up the local government base is also a prerequisite of any, any project to level up, uh, level up uh, the country. We need to dust down the local industrial strategies that were developed. You know, strong documents that will allow uh, a real, um, real focus on industrial strengths in our different uh, towns, uh, towns and cities. We do need uh, to develop a London style public transport system in the cities outside of, of London that's as affordable and as reliable as the system we see in London. And we have a plan for that in Greater Manchester. I, 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 again, I would say to ministers, making progress on that is more likely to make levelling up meaningful for people than the promise of a railway line in 20 or 30 years time, as important as that is, uh, it won't actually mean much and it won't level anybody up anytime soon if that is all that leveling leveling up uh, is and i just think to finish on a you know sort of a again a hopefully a note of political consensus you know we have got the 
COP26 in Glasgow uh, later, later this year, we do have an opportunity to come together as the nations and regions of the UK to put forward a, a plan that actually could, if we're serious about it, deliver thousands of high quality jobs to the generation of people who've been most scarred by, by COVID. If we were to invest now in retrofitting homes and properties, giving people the skills in modern methods of construction, green energy, we would be in a position in the North to say things to young people here that we've probably never been able to say since the 60s or 70s, i.e. if you develop these skills, you will have a quality job for rest of your, the rest of your life as we work towards the date of a zero carbon country by 2050, 2038 in Greater Manchester. We have to rise to that moment with policies of, of real scale and not the pea shooter policies of Whitehall, as, as Lord Kersley uh, rightly, rightly uh, re refers to some of our policy responses. So I'll finish there, Andrew. It's a massive moment that we are living through. It requires, in my view, uh, plans of equal, of equal scale to be able to level up this country coming out of this. It is a much bigger challenge than any of us have realised. But there's a final thing that devolution can do, and that is to sort of re reinstate some sense of trust and buy in to the, to the process at the, at the, at the ground level, um, create a sense of involvement and ownership of, of the change that is going to be needed uh, across, across the country, a healthier way of, of doing politics. I think we've arrived at this moment now where we, we carry on the path that we're on. Gordon Brown is right, in my view. Uh, we can't make any assumptions that the UK will will continue to exist in its current form. Change is needed, it needs to be embraced now, and we need to create a sense of consensus around the levelling up challenge. Excellent, thank you very much, um, Andy. Um, we are just about at quarter past, but uh, bear with me, I'm gonna be a prerogative and say, I'm gonna let it run for two minutes because I want to just get a, a quick sense check from my, uh, from my three panel members. Each of them have talked about this being a, a moment of change. And I, I wanna just get a sense, maybe start with you, uh, Andy, you draw it on then, you know, you, you're, all three of you are constantly talking to government about what needs to be done and, you know, the challenges that you're all facing. I mean, how confident are you that in a sense, they also grasp that this is the moment and that, you know, the time of devolution and the time for local leadership is now, and they're prepared to do the hard yards to make that happen through 2021. I mean, how confident are you that they, they understand the, the gravity of the issue in the way that you've all, all three of you and indeed our first panel laid out. Andy? Um, I would say the confidence has been shaken a little um, living through the response so far because it has been highly centralised as I said. It feels that we've moved backwards rather than forwards when it comes to a more devolved uh, settlement uh, yeah. in, this, in this country. But to be fair, they are the first government that has put the notion of levelling up the region seriously on the table. And I, I wish the government I was in had done much more uh, on levelling up. So I'm not going to get into pointless party political criticism. They, they have got the right theme. This is the theme of our times. This has to be done if this country is to come out of this and hang together as a, as a collection of nations and regions. But, but this is the challenge I would put back to them. You know, if they're not careful, levelling up will become the new big society, a slogan without any substance. And I don't see yet a credible plan to level up this country. It is a much more challenging job than I think the government has so far acknowledged. Infrastructure, yes, is part of it, but it's much more about the nature of people's work, the nature of people's homes, the nature of people's communities, the strength of our councils, those are the foundations on which you will have to level up the country. And they are currently pretty shattered, uh, certainly in the north of England. So the government's got the right theme. I, I pay tribute to them for, for doing that. But I, I think they have now got to accept that what they've promised the people of the north and the people of the English regions is a much, much bigger undertaking than perhaps they've so far acknowledged. And um, it can't be done one political party alone operating top down out of Whitehall. This has to be a collective national endeavor in every region, in every city, in every town. 
And that is what this country now desperately needs coming out of this, this pandemic, shared ownership of the levelling up challenge. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, Rajesh, give us your, your reflection. How confident are you that the government grasps the, the, you know, the magnitude of the challenge, but also the opportunity? Rajesh. Well, not a huge amount. I mean, the government has acknowledged that London has seen sharper job losses than any other region during the pandemic with 4.6% of the people losing work. But it was extremely concerning that there were very few announcements specifically to London in last year's uh, CSR, given its unique, unique circumstances. And what was announced was uh, mostly previous commitments, really. Yes. Even while acknowledging the significant impact on London, the government continues to refuse, the, refuse to acknowledge the capital's economic significance uh, to this country. And I just want to say this, that you know, London is part of the solution and can drive, help drive the uh, recovery throughout the country. And there cannot be a UK recovery without a London recovery. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Do you get a thought from you? Um, just pro warn you, uh, Jesse, uh, if you don't mind, you can have sort of right of response as a kind of final reflection on what you've heard from our, our panelists. If you so wish, you just need to nod your head and I will come to you after we've heard from uh, Judith. But Judith, confidence, yeah. you, you know, where are we? Um, thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say throughout the, um, the crisis and the pandemic, we've done our absolute best to get across to government how much better the outcomes would be if they trusted us more and work with, you know, recognize the work that we do at a local level and all the way through the devolution agenda where, where we've had the, um, the, the growth deals where we've, we, we can demonstrate the work at a local level. But I would just urge anyone who has access to government to um, ask ministers to engage with us more. Too often we've invited ministers to join in the work that we're doing and we've had a, I'm sorry, you know, can't, can't, um, can't take part. That's particularly at a core cities level. Um, so trust us. Um, we, I'd have to say it's work in progress, but I have to remain confident because I believe this is the only way that we're going to get through this crisis. Um, I think the public are recognizing far more what is achieved at a local level where we have the resource and the partnerships to deliver. Um, but I, I have a serious question that I need to ask. I don't think we have a proper definition of what levelling up means. So can I ask ministers that they get a real definition of levelling up so that we can work with them to enable to, to us to, to help deliver it? No, that's a very good point. Uh, Jesse, would you just like to, to sort of offer a a reflection on what you've heard and particularly this sort of you know grasping the, the magnitude and the, the opportunity well thank you very much Andrew. And again i was very interested by the comments of the last uh, panel i thank the speakers very much for that uh, i i think the point andy burnham made was absolutely right which is this is a major major challenge a recognition of that there's a major and it's also as he says rightly it's not just about infrastructure it's also about uh, a whole range of things and housing and uh, skills and the rest of it. We, we recognize that. Um, I would say a couple of other things. First is that, of course, uh, I mean, he was also right to recognize that this is a, a government that has identified a challenge that's going to need to be sustained over time, regardless of the identity of, of, of uh, future governments. I don't personally think centralization uh, was the cause of uh, the um, uh, imbalances and inequalities we've seen. Uh, on the contrary, in many ways, it's been the, um, uh, the effect to counteract that. But as society evolves, as economies evolve, so government needs to evolve. And the other point I would make is that I, I hope it's well understood that um, this government and its predecessors were ones that gave the whole mayoral devolution agenda a massive boost and kickstart, precisely because we thought there was a benefit uh, to that and that uh, those powers should be devolved. And we're in the process of seeing the fruits of that. And uh, of course, there's pressure to do more, but there's always pressure to do more. The other final thing I would say is um, it, it is it ought to be recognised that uh, the Zen of Cities is rightly bringing together people who are you know, from a local government and a mayoral level leaders in their areas and rightly so. But there are there are other parts of the country um, and I'm not singling any out, and I'm not singling out mayoralties or local authorities, where standards and leadership aren't as great. 
as um, we would like. And sometimes, it, you know, central government can't just be about, um, it needs to be about supporting really successful models and then rolling them out. But it also needs to be about making sure that people can survive and do well and flourish, even when that, as it were, they're not being given quite the leadership they need locally. And then looking at ways in which you can make that happen more widely. And I think you've seen additional measures to devolve uh, uh, powers in local government. And I, I hope that will lead to, and it looks like it is leading to, better leadership at the local level uh, uh, across the country as well. So we're in the middle of an agenda. Let's do more and let's focus on it. And thank you very much for this extremely useful and interesting session. No, no, at all. And thank you very much for, you know, for your willingness to come back and, and respond to what we've uh, heard. Thank you all for your patience. I apologise profusely for running, running over, but I hope you agree um, it was worth it. Um, I'd like to thank all my speakers, Abby, Peter, Steve, Jesse, Judith, Rajesh, Andy, and obviously my colleague Paul, for your great insights and reflections. Um, you'll find all uh, our work in relation to Cities Outlook 21, uh, the report, the data, the blogs, the videos, all of it on our website, centervercities.org forward slash cities outlook. And if you're a, a data wonk or you want to know and get under the skin of some of the numbers that you heard from Paul earlier on. We're running a session on Thursday, which is much more explicitly looking at the data and what that's telling us. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please uh, have a look on our website for the event details and sign up. Um, finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and for your patience, as I said, for when we overran. This was our first event uh, of 2021. It certainly won't be our last. So until the next time, uh, take care and stay safe. Thanks very much indeed. Goodbye.